thank you for being here. Uh, I was here exactly a year ago uh, to chit chat about what this thing was going to be. Now it's here. I'm very proud of it. We spent countless, countless hours, actually like two years old together, um, debating it, planning it, how to attack it. Uh, and then roughly, I'm just looking at somebody who might know exactly, but I don't see that person. It's close to, it was close to 42 days of recording, uh, nine to 10 hours a day recording. Uh, so it was really like a precisely deep sampled uh, with constantly um, quality check if it held up to the standards that we wanted it to be. Uh, and obviously uh, we had wonderful players I wanted to fake this that I played all the brass instruments myself, but I can't hold that up uh, because I don't play brass instruments. So we actually got people in who actually know what they're doing. Um, and um, so we recorded everything at the Teldec studio in, in Berlin. Uh, wonderful sounding studio. I've recorded film scores there before. It's a really, really great place. Uh, great players. Um, and so finally this thing came to, uh, came to a close. And then at the same time, um, uh, Orchestral Tools was developing a design player that gives all these extra possibilities that I would like to see in the, in the brass library. One of the big features, obviously, is the, the merging of the microphone positions into like a single stereo stem or a single quad, what, what, whatever format you would like, uh, to save uh, CPU and disk, uh, disk power in this space. And, um, I'm super happy with it. Uh, it pretty much replaced everything in my template, uh, and it's just uh, that. And uh, and it's not that I like to see my own name that often, but uh, when I do go to my brass library tracks in my template, and I again hear day after day how they sound, I do get a, uh, put a smile on my face. So uh, I'm happy that the mission was uh, accomplished. Um, We've gotten e enormous warm feedback uh, from, uh, from the community uh, working with this. Uh, and it's been a really, really great experience all around. And so instead of me uh, talking here for God knows how long until I get bored of myself, I just would like to immediately open it up to questions that you, might, that you might have that you would like to ask me regarding this brass library or how to make a great espresso because I got a really good espresso machine. I got really into that. I can talk a lot about that too. Um, and then maybe next year when you come back, it's orchestral and espresso tools. And then we do like, uh, you know, we do some more products. So any question? Yes. Yeah, just yeah, just uh, just coming out. Let's see if it starts feedbacking, or maybe I'll just gonna stand over here. Oh, this all works out. Yeah. Um, so if I don't, uh, if I'm not mistaken, I think I remember you mentioning before you started the project that something you were looking for in a library was being able to play like different articulations within the same patch. I think you were mentioning like the London Suite from Mortal Engines. Uh, do you think you're able to, or do you think you were able to achieve that with this library? In, like for example, being able to play staccatos and legatos and like within the same patch instead of having to have to. Yeah, well, there's various different ways how to set this up. Uh, so the way that I've set it up at this point, but that's just because I'm used to that, is that um, I have all the different articulations loaded in the sign player, and I access them with a different MIDI channel. And then in Cubase, uh, I work with expression maps. So I have my key editor open, and uh, you see all the notes, short notes, long notes, and then you see a chord, and then you see uh, individual notes. And then with the expression map underneath, you just choose what articulation it is. It works super, super fast. Um, so that is a way that I love to work. Um, obviously, a design player offers the, the performance mode where you could load this, all these articulations and then you can, for instance, say, when I play this velocity, it goes to this. Or when I play that velocity, it goes to that. Or you can use a, 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 a control change or you can use uh, any other controller that you, that you want. Um, so it's very uh, flexible how you, how, you, how you can set that up. That is more a feature of the sign player than actually the brass library. But uh, I am able with the, the seven, eight articulations that come with these instruments uh, to program uh, my brass lines as, you know, as natural as possible for the, for the music that I envision it to be. 
with, uh, of course, the incredible dynamic use, uh, uh, use uh, of, of uh, the recordings. Because that was one of the uh, major reasons to go into this bra brass library. I felt all the brass libraries out there were simple, not soft enough and not loud enough. And so we are covering now the whole dynamic range of a brass instrument. Another really great feature of the sign player is what we talked about while developing the brass player at the brass library was that you can switch some of these uh, uh, dynamic layers off. And so now it means that your mod wheel has the whole range to go between two different uh, dynamic ranges or three. So you could say, I'm just recording a trailer track and I need the loudest from the loudest. You could potentially only have the top dynamic layers on, uh, forte and fortissimo, and you switch mezzo forte, piano, and pianissimo, you switch them off. And so now your whole mod wheel is used to go from forte to fortissimo. Uh, so it's a very flexible uh, feature. You can just do this on the fly. <coughs> Any other question? Mm. Yeah, come on. Hi. Uh, I have actually two questions. The first one is concerning the vibrato of the instruments, because I, I think I was talking with someone like of the orchestra school yesterday. I noticed that on the trumpet, you just have the vibrato recorded, but it's not in, all, in every instrument. Some of them is just like, it seems like not to be like actually a sample. Uh, I was wondering why this choice. And the second one was it's out of curiosity, the way you prepared the the recording of the sample if it's like sampled out of a performance or just in a way okay um so let's start with the, the last question first um so the way that we recorded the notes uh, and the articulations uh that is some sort of a secret recipe uh so we don't really want to give that out uh, how to do that uh, so we don't want to make it easier for the competition to do the same thing um, but we we figured it out in detail how to do it um, now let's go back to your uh, to your first question um, what we did is to record the, the instrument how it appears most of the time in its natural playing uh, so trumpets have the tendency to put a little bit of vibrato in, trombones not so much. Uh, and uh, French horns, you actually need to ask for it. And, uh, and then they'll give you the look and then, you know, they'll do it. But, uh, but a, a, a trumpet, it's kind of like a little bit built into the, in, into the way that the player plays. Um, you see something similar in the, in the, in the string group. Like uh, even though the viola sits right in the middle of the violin and the cello, the violin and the cello love vibrato. Violas, meh, you gotta ask for it. You gotta bribe them with some money and then they, they will play with vibrato. But uh, they, it, it doesn't come natural with the, with the playing. Um, um, and so, um, similar to the, to the brass instruments. Uh, so, how they appear the most, in the most natural way. Any other question? Yeah. Um, hi, by the way, great to meet you. Hello. Um, so I've, I've only been playing it around, playing around with it for just a second, uh, and while it sounds fantastic already, um, I guess this is in two questions. If, uh, if I wanted to mix for a certain sound, did you record them in, in a certain patch or a certain section of the sign uh, player? Did you record them dry or with the ability of maybe changing the mix just a little bit more if we wanted to attack from a different sound? Or okay. So yeah, let's, let's talk a little bit about the sound. It's a really good question, actually. So um, uh, first off, it comes with two sets of microphone positions. One is absolutely natural. There is some processing done to enhance the natural quality of, uh, of the recording, um, but it's not overly processed. It's just making sure things were in phase with one another, that the stereo image is nice and wide and things like that. Um, the second set of mixes is what I did together with Alan Myerson. That is pretty much processed. I mean, like any pr any plugin on the planet was, you know, was dragged into it to boost more low ends into the horns and to emphasize the the high ends of the chimbasos or the or the, the growl of the tubas or the, the uh, get rid of certain frequencies in the trumpets or or enhance them. So no trickery box was untouched uh, to to get what we wanted. A huge amount of multi-band compression uh, on different sets of microphones. So we spent a good week uh, just playing around with uh, processing for that alone. Um, so now let's talk about uh, the, the the size of, of the of the recordings. 
uh, at first we wanted to make sure that it sounded as good as we could uh, of, within the room of uh, Teldex. And Teldex has a beautiful sounding room. And uh, if you want to go for a drier approach, like uh, what you would find, for instance, in uh, a John Williams score, you technically do not have to add reverb to it. I, I would advise to add reverb to it because it's still a sampler and you're switching between samples. And, and the, a, a little bit of reverb to it will smoothen it out. Um, and the other trick that I would use is uh, always put like a slight compressor on, on, your, uh, on your return of the of the sign player um, because when samples get uh, get stacked or doubled up uh, you might get these unexpected spikes in a level it's just nature it's natural to the to a sampler and by adding a little bit of compression you you tuck it down again and we're talking a little bit of compression not like slamming we're talking like a ratio two to one thresholds like minus 10 minus 15 and when it gets loud it just kind of just ducks it back by two to three db with a long attack and a long release that's the most natural uh sound that you will that you will get um and so what we did add is uh two reverb stamps um and you know um we used uh, bruscati um reverbs they're they're fucking expensive uh, so it, it's like a really nice feature to have to have like two reverb stems uh, that you can add to your mix that would immediately beat any any quality uh, uh, software plugin that you might want to use but if you wanted to go for a longer release sale then you have to do this yourself so how I have set it up in my template is that I uh, created with the mic merging feature I created a stem that goes to the front of my speakers then I created a stem that goes to the back uh, of the room, so uh, the surround, if you will. And then that comes back into uh, Cubase uh, for each set of instruments. So for the two horns, there's two stereo channels coming back. For the four horns, there's two stereo channels coming back. For the six horns, for the 12 horns, every each in individual. Then on top of that, I do a little bit of additional processing. So that's how I like it. So there's. Uh, on both of the channels, there are API uh, EQs and compressors, uh, the 550A, the 550B, and then the 2500 compressor when it gets loud to tuck it down a little bit. Uh, and then I add reverb uh, to, um, to the, uh, I add reverb to what goes to the front, but then I have a separate reverb for the front and a separate one for the back. So I'm emulating how a room sounds. So the front has a, uh, a slow early reflection uh, time, with uh, a reverb of uh, 3.1 seconds and then the back reverb has a pre-delay of, of 60 milliseconds, 70 milliseconds, slightly longer tail and uh, the high frequencies damp off way quick. So, so it's bright in the front and then it's bright in the back for a, s for a split second and then it goes darker in color and that's how you create a really nice uh, space. Um, and with the mic merging, I also uh, then keep in mind where I want things to do, where I want to have them in panning. So if you, if you keep the faders like right in the middle, uh, when, you, uh, when the, the microphone positions, when you put them up, um, they have a natural position where they would sit in, in, in the orchestra. So we, we, we thought about this a long time. It's like, do we want to go for a full mono signal or do we want to go for the orchestral setting? And we, we picked the orchestral setting. So the, the horns lean more towards the left and the tenor is a little bit more to the right and then the tuba is more all the way in the right and the trumpet's like somewhere in the middle. Um, but you can easily reprocess yourself uh, to make like a whole different uh, sound of it. Um, so that's what it what I do with the, with the mixing. And then the other thing that I do is that um, when I have all my French horns set up, uh, in Cubase I add a VCA fader to all the French horns and then I add a VCA fader to all the tenor bones, a VCA fader to all the bass bones, VCA fader to uh, the tuba and the chimbasso uh, at the same time. And then I can do some extra balancing uh, very quickly with just like four faders if, it's, if, if I want to emphasize this more or a little bit more that. So, Without touching any of that, the brass group will sound completely unbalanced how it would appear in real life, 
But if you do film scores with a lot of programming uh, in basis and in the lower end, sometimes you want to bring the tuba down or sometimes exactly the opposite. You want to really boost it to like an unnatural uh, level uh, to get a, a really roaring quality to, your, uh, to, to the, the, the track that you're working on. I hope that uh, explains something. Uh, any, any other question? Yeah. Well, first off, thank you for Junkie X Studio Time. It's an uh, incredible YouTube channel. Uh, second off, um, the two questions. One is Pro Tools AAX support. Is there any future in that? Um, and, um, and I forgot my second question. But <laughs> the first, is Pro Tools going to be supporting uh, the AAX version of yeah. Well, well, technically, that uh, for people who uh, heard that, uh, if it, so, this is not a Jake's or Brass question. This is a, an orchestral tool sign player question. So I'm looking at Hendrik. Uh, um, when there will be a Pro Tools AX support? So, hello, everyone. Hi, I'm Hendrik. Hi, nice to meet you. Um, <laughs> so, I guess I'm the technical guy, right? And, I have to answer some problems or whatever. No, um, the AX version um, is uh, in doing right now, so uh, will be available quite soon. Um, we need some time to make sure that it runs fluidly, and as soon as it gets available, you can download it from getsci.com for free. So, yeah, thanks. And, uh, the other question is, uh, with the template, uh, will you be uh, going doing a studio time with, with how to create a template with a? Yes, I mean, uh, so there's um, there's already a couple of uh, studio times that I that I shot uh, to do um, some introductionary talking about the library and how I have it set up and and how I work. But um, yes, I will be doing that. And um, orchestration is going to go into a whole different tier uh, uh, with the combination uh, Dorico and and Cubase by programming everything in the expression map. And you you. You export it into Dorico, and it's all there, including the articulations, dynamic mapping, the whole thing. Dorico is an orchestration program developed by Steinberg Notation Program, and um, and I know a lot of orchestrators here in town that have been working primarily with uh, Sibelius. They're all eyeing Dorico right now to make the switch. Uh, so they did something right. Any other question? Mm. I echo his sentiments. Thank you very much for the library and for studio time. Can you talk a little bit as a composer and also a user of a tool like this library, which is amazing, we can make it as big as we want, which could be a danger if we go too big and then go in with an orchestra and can't reproduce it. So when do you, when you're working, sit back and go, you know what, this is big enough. I do want to tell you this, the guy, the guy who invented the quote, less is more, is a fucking idiot because more is more. I just want to, I just, just want to make this very clear. So uh, having, having that pointed out, um, so I am in a luxurious position uh, with uh, some of my other uh, fellow film composers that if we have an idea, we can execute that because the film studio will support that and, and, and that and that comes with the finances too. So if I want to record for Mortal Engines 44 brass players, they, they'll come up with the money and they'll make it, they'll make it happen. So for Mortal Engines, I really wanted that, um, that sound of Berlioz, um, Symphonie Fantastique, um, and just really that insane brass sound and, and, and woodwind sound. Um, so I would say in LA, if I do a film score, I'm going to record Scooby-Doo next week, and there are scenes in that movie that are really big. Uh, I can't tell you why, but they're really big in an orchestral color. And so my brass setting for that is 12 French horns, six tenor bones, three bass bones, uh, three contra bass bones, uh, one chimbasso, one tuba, and six trumpets. Um, and so that size of a brass ensemble will never work together. I, it doesn't matter how many thousand strings you throw in a room. It, 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 it's, it's never a competition. But I just love the sound of that size. It, it just gives like a quality to it. Now, if, so as you guys know that have dealt with live recordings of instruments, there's a magic number to everything, right? Uh, so 
there's like 14 first violins, 14 second violins. It's a magic number. But if you go to 21 first and 21 seconds, it doesn't give you anything extra. It just gives you messiness. Mm -hmm. and, and so there's something similar happened in the, in the brass. Like six trumpets, you can get really great effects, especially if they play uh, staccato and then legato, um, staccatissimo, and you have three voices by two trumpets, you can get really magic out of it. If you take nine trumpets, that is gone. And, and it's, it's just messy. The same with 12 French horns. A big heroic line for a superhero on 12 horns sounds absolutely fantastic. 18 horns, it, you just, it, it loses the plot. And so there's a magic number to things. And obviously, every number below that, there are magic combinations. You know, just the, 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 the four horn uh, standard writing for a classic orchestra. And there's usually a fifth horn uh, to take over when one of the guys is tired. And there's already somebody tired when they're playing the orchestra. You know, don't ask me why. But uh, so there are these magic numbers there. And so um, what I wanted to do with this brass library is to be able to, to offer people tools to end right uh, in a natural sense uh, for, for, that, for that scenario. So in my case, I record 12 horns, usually standard for, for bigger action movies. So there's a 12 horn patch to play your monophonic line. There's a six horn patch to play your, your two harmony line. There's a four horn patch to play a triad chord. So that's, that's how that was designed. And, and somewhat similar with the, with the tenor bones and with the, and with the trumpets. Uh, so, but you know, playing a triad on a 12 horn patch sounds fucking great, you know, and uh, how, and so, the, but it's also, in sample lands, things work different than in a life, in the live world. So, uh, six horns that play a triad can actually sound way fuller than a triad played on a 12, uh, 12 horn patch, mm -hmm. if that makes any sense. So you can play a, a triad on a, a 12 horn patch, which technically is 36 horns. And then you have a live recording of six live horns playing that same triad. The six horn players will sound way fatter and, and way, more, way more power to it. So that is always like the difference between sampling and, and, and uh, live playing. And there's so many different type of instruments where you have that frustration, I have that frustration with. Whoever has uh, had the pleasure or uh, um, whatever, to stand in, uh, in front of a church organ while it's actually being played in a, in a, in a church, like for instance that insane uh, organ in Manchester, uh, and then you hear the sample library version of that, forget about it. it it's, it's, it's just like 2% of what that thing really is. Um, and, and it's, but it's hard to record that stuff and to sample that stuff. Um, and then people compare it with uh, uh, natural uh, classical orchestral recordings. I've never been a fan of classical orchestral recordings. Not because of the music, I love the music, but the way that it was recorded. Uh, so, for instance, in Amsterdam, uh, the Concertgebouw, which is like one of the best orchestra orchestras in the world, they have like two or three microphones coming from the ceiling, hanging above the orchestra, and that's how they record the whole fucking uh, uh, concert. And it just sounds thin, it sounds narrow, it, it just doesn't sound great. The only thing that's left is an insane performance of, uh, of a piece. Um, and. The thing that we do with film scoring is we, we, we take the time uh, to mic uh, our brass section or to mic our string section and we can do whatever we want. Uh, for Mad Max, I had all the celli and the bass uh, basses close mics like this much from the, from the bridge. And in the classical world, they would never do that. Um, the French horns, for instance, that we sampled for this library uh, had also microphones in the back uh, to, to get the sound of the bell. Even though the typical sound that we know from French horns doesn't come from the back, it's, the, it's whatever comes from the front and the reflection against the wall of what comes out of the bell. And the combination of that is what we know as the French horn. Um, but it gives you really interesting, uh, interesting textures. And uh, that's the beauty of like, uh, working in film scoring and recording instruments in a, in a, in a different setting and you can be way more uh, colorful. So that's why it's so hard with um, uh, sample libraries uh, to mimic, for instance, an, a, a classic orchestral recording of, let's say, Daphne and Chloe, because Daphne and Chloe on any record on Deutsche Gamma Throne sounds like this. The performance is 
beyond, you know, just like their performances out there from Herbert from Karajan, uh, from from uh, Riddle, from from um, the the best in the world, um, and. Um, but the sound quality is just, is just thin. It's, it's really that typical classic uh, orchestral recording. And uh, so if you now take my brass library that, ha that uses all the microphone techniques that you can possibly get, uh, you, you have something that is way fatter in, in nature. But still, when you compare it to like six French horns and you stand right in front of it, yeah, it's, it's hard to beat that, you know what I mean? Even though it, if it's a simple library. I'm even very realistic about that. So, I hope that answers uh, your question. Any other question? So, a lot of libraries have a problem when you're kind of done with your uh, score and you're in the process of mixing, where a lot of overtones from different sections or even within the sections just don't do, like what live players do live, when they adjust somehow the either the, the pitch or like the way that they're playing to for the overtone series not to kind of hit up for everybody um samples don't do that um did you guys address this issue with the library uh no you can't <clears throat> so the only solution um uh, did people understand that question that she was asking? So the, the only solution to that in the future is physical modeling. And I'm not talking about the physical modeling instruments that are out right now for contact. I'm talking proper physical modeling where you have a computer of which its sole dedication is to calculate the physical modeling of the instrument that you're using at that specific point in time. Uh, Hans Zimmer and I had a demo once of two uh, Italian guys who developed uh, a piano for fizzling modeling with which did exactly that so you play one note it has a series of overtones you play two notes it doesn't play two notes with their own individual separated overtones it plays the calculation of what the overtones of these two notes would be and the effect that it would have on the rest of the piano long story short what they brought was four flight cases that together was one supercomputer just to do two notes they were figuring out how to do a triad they were in the process of doing a triad Welcome to that. That's a piano, you know, where you should be able to play 100 uh, or 88 keys at the same time, you know, just like hold the pedal, clung, 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 and they should all be sounding at the same time. So to be able just to play two notes is interesting, but it's not going to, you know, Rachmaninoff is not going to be happy with that. Let's put it that way. But he's dead anyway, so who fucking cares? Um, so... Um, so the, the idea with physical modeling in the future, but we're, I think we're 10 years away uh, from that at least, uh, to, to in a practical use. Uh, there, there might be like a computer system in five, six years that does physical modeling on a certain, on a certain level, but to make that practical within Cubase or within uh, Pro Tools or in Logic, whatever program you work with, I don't see that happening in the near future. But with phys physical modeling, then you could uh, determine what kind of um, math calculations uh, based on science, uh, physics, you're going to apply to that, how that then uh, reacts with one another. But the, we're so far, the technology is there. I mean, it was developed basically, the idea behind it was developed by Fourier, you know, in the late 1800s. That became the basis of the FM7 synth. Uh, the idea was already developed, you know, what, uh, what would happen with overtones and how to, how to act on that. But technology is simply not there. <coughs> Any other question? Hmm? Yeah. Hi there. Uh, how do you keep your Cubase template from getting too bloated? Uh, I don't. It's bloated. Uh, and it takes a long time to load. But boy, is it great once it's loaded. Um, but what I do try to do when I write cues is to keep them long. Uh, so I really don't do the 20 second cues or the 15 second cues because that thing takes 14 minutes to load in its full effect. Uh, and if my VSO machines crash, which happen every now and then, it takes 58 minutes to load them back up. Um, so, um, but they're usually on 24 hours a day and they never crash. Uh, knock, knock on wood. Is this wood? Yeah, knock on wood. Uh, so. Um, I try to write like longer cues. So uh, I was talking about Scooby-Doo, like the longest cue in that movie is 19 minutes. So it's just basically continuous writing of, of, of 19 minutes. Uh, also, your writing becomes way better as a composer. If, if you were to divide up a movie in, um, let's say, 150 cues, you're going to end up with 150 cues that are a minute and a half each. And by the time you've closed your session and you open your next one up, 
uh, you kind of forgot where you left it off and your transition of music throughout the film is going to be less fluent and could even be jarring. You could be making the same mistakes in a new cue that you did before. And so that's why it's very important for beginning composers to consistently play the movie back with all your music in it at least one time a day, you know, maybe at the end of the day. And you get a really good understanding how the flow of the music is uh, throughout the score, where you overcook it, where you undercook it, where you're using the theme too many times in its first installment. Maybe you should go to the B section of the theme or the C section or do some uh, classic music trickery like retrograde, mirror, uh, you know, whatever you want to do with it to, to make it cohesive but different. Um, so um, I'd rather have a template that is full and has everything there that I need. Um, but then I just keep writing in long form and it's, it, it, it creates something that's, that's more cohesive. Mm. Also conforming is a little bit easier because you only need to deal with like technically one queue instead of like potentially 20 queues or 30 queues. Mm. So it, it, and sometimes uh, in a session like that there would be a gap of a minute where there's no music. I'm not saying it's continuously uh, 20 music, uh, 20 minutes of music or 19, it would be gaps of 40 seconds or a gap of a minute and a half. Uh, so that, that happens all the time. Any other question? Uh, sorry? Back to coffee. What, what kind of coffee beans are you using? Oh, don't get me started. Uh, so, okay, so, but I'm, I'm, I'm in good company here. Uh, I use a German coffee machine. I just got it. It's uh, the, the maker is ECM. Uh, it's handmade, uh, and um, it's good. It's really good. Uh, so I have a coffee grinder with that as well. I can tell you exactly everything you need to know, like uh, about what type of bean, what kind of soil they were they were grown on, how the roasting process went, how long it took to ship it uh, to wherever you need to go, how long you can keep it, what the, the best grind is for the espresso, how much pressure you need to apply, 15 pounds to be exact, to get a good espresso. Uh, and uh, the boiler head needs to be exactly 94 degrees Celsius. And when the water comes through, it needs to be 92. When you're done, the coffee should be exactly 84.8 degrees Celsius. Um, and your your milk your your milk frother, you should do you should do it always with your left hand. Your left hand is a little more sensitive to temperature than your right hand. Uh, so you put the the milk frother in your left hand. You put the the frother on, and um, you need to stick it in to get rid of the excessive steam. And then you need to bring it up until it starts making very little bubbly sound. And then 15 seconds later, if correct, your milk has uh, increased in size by 1.6. Uh, and, and then when it gets so warm on your hands that it almost feels uncomfortable to hold it much longer, that's when the milk is done and the milk should reach exactly 64 degrees Celsius. So when you're done serving your coffee, your coffee is actually lukewarm, it's not hot. When espresso or any latte art is being served to you and it's hot, you know you're in the wrong coffee shop. The coffee, the coffee should be served lukewarm and you gotta drink it quick before it gets cold. That's a true uh, espresso style. Um, I might do I, I might do a coffee time with Junkie XL on Studio Time once. I did I did one on Carbonara. Uh, uh, it's one of the be better watched their videos. I was like, I'm going to stop doing these composing videos. I'm going to start a cooking show, you know, or something like that. Uh, any other questions? Yeah, come on, coming out. You mix your own material for movies. Are you fucking crazy? <laughs> how, do, how do you do that? <laughs> like yeah, yeah, I'm an idiot. Uh, many people know that. Uh, yeah, so um, what people maybe don't know is that my first career uh, was actually engineering and mixing and producing. Uh, so I started working in the studio when I was 14 as an assistant engineer. Uh, by the time I was 16, 17, I was producing my own bands. Uh, and... Uh, by the time I was 20, 21, I started branching out to more international bands and uh, I worked a lot with metal bands from LA. Uh, I worked with uh, Sepultura, Machine Head, Fear Factory. Uh, <laughs> uh, so uh, a, a lot of these type of bands. So that was my first career. And so um, then I decided to make uh, uh, music for myself. And that uh, first I had an industrial metal band that was called Nerve. Uh, I was signed to play it against them. And I was uh, touring, especially in Europe. And I was in the same scene as Nine Inch Nails and It's a Rap and, and uh, that, uh, Einstutzen und Neubauten, uh, Bauhaus, you know, that, 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 that whole scene. 
Uh, ministry, ministry was part of that revolting Cox from 242. That, so that's like 88 to like 92, 93. And that's when I started Junkie XL and then it, it, stuff became more electronic. I was a very angry young kid, but by the time I was like 26, I was not that angry anymore. I stopped yelling and stopped screaming and the distortion got turned down a little bit and it became electronic dance music. Uh, and so I did that for many years and then I became uh, a film composer eventually. Um, but all the knowledge that I picked up on in all those years before, I still wanted to utilize that in, in the music that I'm doing right now. And for me, mixing my own film scores, especially when it's a very typical type of film score, like uh, just to name a few, um, Alita is one of them, Mortal Engines is one of them, uh, and especially Deadpool and, uh, and Mad Max. Uh, it needs such a unique approach to mixing. It's not just like putting the faders up and oh yeah we need to do this with EQ or we need to do that oh let's add a reverb to it it's really like mixing becomes like a voice in 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 the music and a character uh, like how you compress and how you do this and how you do that and how you slam stuff together um, so I'm not afraid to take like traditional orchestral recordings and slam the shit out of it with with multi-band compressors and, uh, and and whatnot to give it the attitude that uh, that it that it needs to have and um, so that's also how i approach uh, orchestral recordings when i record players live every time when i record an orchestra i'll talk to the people uh, uh, before the before the the recording and i say listen I'm not looking for a perfect recording. I'm looking for a recording that has the right attitude, whether it's an aggressive attitude or a very emotional attitude or a very heartbroken or a very nervous or a very scary. That's what's important to me. Any mistake that you guys make, I can fix, I can fix uh, digitally. You know, just like with Melodyne, you can get rid of a, of a wrong note. Uh, timing, you can fix with, with editing. There's so many things you can do with editing. You can do like a few takes and just take the best bits of it. But what will kill an orchestra is do the same cue 10, 15, 20 times because there are mistakes. By the time you're done recording, you might have a perfect recording between brackets but all the soul and all the life is gone. And, and these guys, they're used to play Prima Vista from, from paper, first time reading, first time performance. You might want to do a second take, but you have to stop after that. You're gonna, they're gonna lose their interest and, and you, you get really bland uh, recordings. And there's quite a few film scores out there that have a really bland uh, orchestral voice to it. <clears throat> and I think part of that is, is that uh, um, people sometimes just don't know when to stop recording uh, musicians. I mean, anybody who is a musician here, the fire you feel the first two, three takes when you play something is insane. When you get to take 25, it's, it's out of the window. It, it becomes frustrating, your, your muscles start to clamp up, uh, and, and things are just not great from that point on. Mm? So, I hope that answers your question. <clears throat> but mixing is also too much fun for me, uh, and I, I'm also a welcome guest in the in the in the at the dubbing stage. For the people that don't know, that's the very very final stage of, of filmmaking, where uh, a couple of people in there will mix the dialogue, they will mix the music and the sound effects together, so it becomes like one good sounding film. Um, Usually composers are not welcome there because the only thing they say, music needs to be louder. And, and I, I get that, but uh, that's not usually where I, where, when I go. I would be the first one to say, I think we should take the music out here and just have this be like a sound design moment. It's also like a, a human interaction thing, you know, just like you, you hand out uh, a hand to the sound design department saying like, oh, let this be your thing. And what happens then five minutes later, they're like, you know what? Let's take the sound effects out. This could be a really great music moment. And that's how you create really interesting uh, journey throughout a film. Mad Max is a really good example of that where it just goes back and forth between loud sound effects, but then very loud music. And a lot of films out there at this point, it just seems one struggle between the sound effects and the dialogue th and, and, and the music throughout the whole film. Who is, who, they're all screaming for attention and, and none of them really get it. Uh, so. So I think that's an interesting part too of uh, of mixing. Yes. One more question. Um, so you're talking about how you want to avoid it being bland by over recording. Did you have a similar approach when doing the orchestral tools uh, brass library? 
Yeah, so this is a different thing that people forget. Uh, when you build, when you build any um, uh, orchestral library, any acoustic library, let's put it that way, the biggest mistake that people do is a do not get the uh, they don't get the right players in. For instance, um, a piano. People just think about a piano as like, oh, but you know, Horowitz can play the notes, but I can play that C too, you know, with my fingers. So why don't I sample this piano and I'll, I'll be done with it? You create a piano that doesn't sound inspirational. And the same with percussion, it's even worse. Uh, like a lot of percussion libraries out there are, are sometimes played by the people who work for the company. It's just like, oh yeah, but we all know how to hit a drum. It's like, no, you don't. And, and so you gotta get the right people in. That's very important. The second thing that you ask these people to do is like, okay, you have to play, let's say, 20 times in a row, a G3 concert pitch with uh, the dynamic uh, mezzo forte. But every time you ask them to do that, you're asking them to play a performance of that note that has all the passion in that specific note. It's not just like a bunch of guys that sit there, okay, G3, pull. Okay, let's do one more. It's, that's when you create like a bland, uh, boring sound. And um, it, every note that is played needs to come from, you know, a place of emotion, a, play, a place of soul uh, played into it. And this is the hardest thing to ask, you know, on a, on a, on a sample recording uh, day. Because it, if you don't do it right, it becomes like a mind-numbing uh, experience for everybody involved. So how we fix that, that's a secret I'm not going to share. But, um, but, it, but it, it, is, uh, it is, you know, it, it is difficult. It's very difficult. Any other question? Yes. So, so going off of that, you mentioned finding the right players is very important to accomplish what you're saying. How has the process been over the years? developing relationships with the right musicians for these types of uh, sample recordings? Um, well, there's, there's, there's two things to say about that. Uh, one, um, let's talk about my own experience, like how it works with uh, film scoring. It's like when you do your very first film and you have to compile an orchestra together uh, to record it, uh, you're relying on a person that is called a contractor. And the contractor is in touch with all the musicians in town and potentially all the musicians in the world that are even worthwhile uh, talking to, you know? So we're all talking about top of the notch of the notch people, you know, people that have won multiple awards as kids, as the most talented this or the most talented that, and they all end up here in town and they want a career as a, as a musician. The very first film that you do, um, you would ask, and my guys, Peter Rotter, uh, I would ask Peter, it's like, Peter, what would you advise? And he would say, I, I would take that guy. That, so he tries to find people that are not only great players, but they also fit my personality, and they also work together really well as a group. Um, so there are multiple group settings like that in LA, depending on which composer is recording, what type of movie score it is, uh, if, that, if that makes any sense. Now, as you're, as you're recording film score after film score, you start to develop a really good relationship with all these individual players one by one. And then it becomes uh, just networking with yourself. You know, it's just like, oh, we're gonna do, we need like a trumpet section that consistently goes to the C-sharp six. It's like, okay, we gotta have Dave in there because Dave just poof, just goes there like in tune, fortissimo, without breaking up. And so Dave is gonna be there, you know, if, if we have a lot of that in the, in the score. Um, if you would if you would record a trumpet section that is like leaning towards mariachi, you would have a different set of trumpet players, you know? Um, so you develop a relationship with these players. Now let's switch to the brass library. Orchestral Tools has these relationships with brass players in Berlin, exactly the same way that I just described. So I was relying on them to come up with a set of musicians that they would advise would be the best for what I was looking for with this brass library, and they, they uh, kicked it in. And these people came from all kinds of backgrounds as well. And, uh, and um, half of the players were not even native German players. You know, they come from all over the world, ended up in, in Germany. Germany's another one of those countries where uh, the orchestras are considered one of the best in the world, and, and people are 
attracted from all over the world to come there and play in their orchestras. So it's a very international uh, community like that. The same for the Concertgebouw orchestra that I just mentioned. I think there's like maybe 10 people in that whole orchestra that speak Dutch. The rest come from anywhere else in the world. So that's, it's, the same, it's the same process. Any other question? Okay, that's going to be the last one and then I'm going to hand it over uh, to you, sir. Uh, what advice would you give us uh, for time management? Because I know that, I mean, compose music for a film can be a lot of work, but then you have your family, you have uh, to travel, you have a lot of other responsibilities. So how do you manage all that? Okay, he's, he's, talking, he's asking me a question about time management. Um, so especially, uh, especially when you're beginning, um, and, and I even advise this to people that are more professional, but they still fuck up, uh, which is, you know, it's a very human thing. It's very simple. For instance, um, I'm about to start at a movie that is two hours and 20 minutes long, and I have 12 weeks to do it. So, um, but that is including delivering the mix and the stem to the scoring stage. That's going to take me two weeks, 10 weeks left. Uh, then things need to be orchestrated, need to, need to be prepped uh, to record. Okay, another week gone. Uh, so now we're, take, we're talking nine weeks. Um, and then um, we need to build in room uh, for notes from the director and notes from the studio that they want completely different things at the very end. Okay, let's take another week off. So now we're talking eight weeks. Um, so you can then quickly calculate, it's like I need to write at least 20 minutes a week to get the movie even done. Uh, so then you're talking 20 minutes a week and then you might say, I don't want to work Saturday and Sundays. Okay, that's four or five minutes every day throughout the week. Uh, and you might say, okay, but Monday night I've got to go to a school recital of one, uh, one of my kids and Tuesday morning I want to do uh, my rugby training and on Wednesday night I want to join uh, uh, how to make an espresso time with uh, Tom and Tarzana so that night is gone uh, so uh, then you're basically taking three massive chunks out of your weekdays which now means that the days that you do work you have to deliver six to seven to eight minutes a day and that's how you need to plan and then um, you break the movie down in the type of cues that you need to do always start on the hardest cue and always start on the cue that, that is the most important to the director because that cue you will be on forever if that makes any sense so i always ask the director what is your what is the most important part of the movie for you and he would say well that's this chunk here of 12 minutes that's the first thing that i will start on because that is his baby that is his his um, center of the film where everything comes together so most likely he will not approve that cue in one go most likely he will not approve that cue in 10 goes. He'll still have notes the week before you record. He'll still have notes on the day that you record. So uh, that's stuff you just need to, need to be aware of. And then you make a planning like that. And then the next question becomes, am I going to be able to do this alone? Or do I need to attract extra help in? And then you do a little bit of calculation. Let's say the number that you're making on this movie is 100. Just, like a, just a number, 100. And, um, but if you were to do this in 12 weeks, you're going to be dead at the end of it because you're going to be worn out, stressed out, potentially from burnout. But potentially by spending 20, you have a really good person who's going to help you with that. And then your workload is going to be less. And, uh, you know, you can go to uh, coffee time with Junkie XL and Tazana Wednesday night, you know. So, um, so th this is how I would look at at, at uh, time management. You gotta you gotta think about it on on uh, forehand, and b and based on that, exactly that same science, I I determine whether I can take on a second project that slightly overlaps with the other or not. But there are things happening in this industry I cannot control. So I the, how I like it is to take on a movie that finishes. Uh, 10 to 12 weeks before the next one finishes. So you have 10 to 12 weeks to completely dedicate to that one movie if shit goes wrong or wh whatever. And then so that's how I try to overlap uh, the movie. So that technically means roughly four movies a year, four, four to five a year. Um, but the problem uh, as it is in Hollywood uh, with all its wisdom is that you're halfway through a film and then they decide let's release this movie next year. Tom, take a break. We'll come back to you next year. Nobody's calling me. Are you available? 
they just they just notify me it's going to be next year and so then you're looking at your calendar you're like shit now this movie is completely overlapping with this other thing that i booked and and it's just your responsibility to deal with that and so again then we go back to time management i'm scratching my head how we're going to work this out how how is this going to work how is that going to work so it's pretty much what i do myself as well and then as the time as time goes by you get more experienced by it and and then you also feel whether it's going to work out or not so then your feelings start playing in on on this in the beginning when you just start everything is just panic so you just got to plan it out for yourself to take the panic away just ah i can do that a couple of minutes a day or you can't and then if you can't don't take on the job so thank you all guys um Thanks for being here. Uh, I do want to thank O'Kessel Tools for this incredible collaboration. They're awesome guys. Uh, they're rock solid, not only as persons, but uh, also as innovators and uh, technical builders. And uh, I'm honored uh, to, week with, to work with a bunch of Germans. And that's a big thing to say for a Dutch guy. <laughs> that's a big, because we're, we're neighbors. and. Uh, in soccer, that doesn't work all, all that great. But uh, in uh, sample libraries, it's a marriage made in heaven. So it's all good. Good luck, Masim. Thank you, Tom. So I guess we'd all love to talk for another few hours with you. Um, but I want to thank you, everyone, for being here and asking all these questions. We also have to thank Tom for being here, for his time. And it's been a pleasure. Thank you to you all.